Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the plow. And the five-string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. My Bigfoot sighting occurred in the year 2007 in Timmins, Ontario. We were about 70 kilometers west of the little town. It's a mining town up in northern Ontario. Very densely uh, forested area. Lots of coniferous trees. Lots of sandy roads. It's the number one gold mining area in the world with 180 million ounces mined out of the area. A lot of logging industry, very remote. Ontario is a massive province. Most of it is uninhabited. If you get lost in Ontario, you could walk pretty much to the Arctic without seeing anybody. It's that vast. It's quite a cold temperatures. Uh, Even in the summer, the temperatures can go down to uh, seven, eight degrees right in the middle of the summer. Lots of bears, lots of moose. Deers generally don't survive in northern Ontario. There's a lot of wolves, a lot of predation. It's fairly rugged country. There's quite a lot of mountains. Not huge mountains, but hills. A lot of outcrops, granite outcrops, and it's kind of a the land of a thousand lakes. There's thousands of lakes big, small, and rivers that run right through to James Bay. Timmins, Ontario is part of the Arctic watershed, meaning that all the lakes and rivers uh, eventually find their way into the Arctic Ocean from that point. So it's quite a remote northerly area. And the hunting is world-class and the fishing is world-class. With that being said, I was quite an avid outdoorsman you know, in that part of my life. I spent a lot of times hunting and fishing and pursuing game. There was seemed to be a season for everything. I had a camp at the time. Since then, we sold it. But I had a camp on a lake called Opishing Lake. It was a nice camp. It was rugged. It had electricity, but it was rugged. And I used to spend a lot of my time there, a lot of my weekends. And as much time as I could get off of work, I'd always be out there, you know, enjoying the wilderness. And it was quite a great time in my life. I was, you know, young, full of energy in my early 30s. And I always had a lot of fun fishing and hunting and enjoying my time outdoors. And, you know, I was not afraid of anything. I had a nice hunting dog. He was a black lab. His name was Buck. He was very in tune to the animals in the area and he seemed to understand what i was pursuing so usually i was with him unless i was big game hunting and then i'd leave him at home because sometimes he'd scare off the animals then i didn't want that especially when it came to moose hunting anyway the year 2007 it must have been november late october early november i was hunting for moose and i had come to a place maybe five six miles from my camp it was a logging area now when they log up there they usually take one mile by one mile blocks of forest out and they'll build a road going in and then they'll log an area a mile by a mile and then they'll sometimes they'll go beside it and do another one and they take sections of forest out but what happens is after they take the logs out the new vegetation that grows 
where they've logged often attracts moose in numbers. And it also allows you as a hunter to get visuals on the animals. So other than that, you really can't see into the forest very far at all, like maybe five, 10 feet in that area. The bush is so dense and dark, you really can't get a visual. So it's very hard to close distance on these moose when you're pursuing them. So as an experienced hunter, I would spend my time in the cuts, new cuts to be more precise, hunting moose and trying to get a visual on something that I could shoot. Now, in Ontario, in those years, if you didn't draw a tag for an adult moose, you would have to shoot a calf. When you bought a moose license, you automatically were given a calf tag and you would enter a draw for an adult tag. And if you didn't draw an adult tag, you were pretty much hunting calves. And they're a little bit more tricky because they don't answer calls. So pretty much what you have to do is you have to call the mother out and hopefully she brings the calf with her and then you shoot the calf. So this year in particular, I didn't have a tag for an adult. I had a calf tag and I was trying to focus my hunting on finding that elusive calf and that cow that was harboring a calf. So it was a tougher hunt, but I knew the area well. And like I said, the evidence is in the ground. So I was always tracking animals and I had this one particular cut Oh, about six, seven miles south of my camp. And it seemed to be pretty, pretty active. Like I would show up there in the mornings and I would see quite a few moose tracks that moose that had been frequent in the area. I'd see the tracks and actually I'd come across two bull moose the night before my experience. They seemed to be in the area and they were fighting and I laid eyes on them and I watched them and it was quite something to see. They were in the area and they were scenting the area. They were leaving their mark and scenting and that often acts as like a magnet for cows that are in heat and calves that are following with them, right? So I was pretty focused on this area. I had spotted a calf and a cow track. One day I was hunting and it was getting pretty late. So they seem to go down into this valley. I said, well, it's getting pretty late. You know, it's almost sundown. I'm not going to have time to pursue them. They're not going to come back out in the open tonight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my camp and I'm going to wait to the wee hours of the morning and I'm going to go to where I saw the last track of them. And I'm going to try to call them out for sunup the next morning. So I went back to my camp and I wasn't alone. I was with a friend of mine. She was a good friend who often accompanied me on my hunting trips. She was a Northern girl. She enjoyed the outdoors as much as I did. And we were good friends. And, you know, I thought she'd be perfect to be with me on this hunt. So she tagged along for the ride and. So we went back to my camp and we watched the movies and we took it easy that evening and pretty much got ready for the next morning. And we went to bed nice and early. And the following morning, we woke up at four o'clock and uh, made ourselves a thermos full of coffee and ate something quickly. And uh, we headed back out to the cut. And the idea is that I was going to call these moose back out in the dark so that when it just got bright just as the sun came up they would be out in the open because the habits of these moose is i find that they don't like to be in the open during the daylight hours so you'll catch them in the morning first thing and just before sundown they'll come out to these open areas because they're pretty crafty themselves so we showed up at maybe, oh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, we showed up in the cut. And I remember my truck 
the muffler wasn't in, exactly intact. So it was pretty loud going into this area. And I didn't want to go as far as where I'd seen them go into the valley. So I took the road and uh, went nice and slow as I could and crawled in there with the truck. And I parked the vehicle. And what ended up happening was um, I shut the vehicle down and I rolled open the windows a little bit and and uh, told my friend, I said, Jess, I said, you stay here, stay in the truck here, and I'm going to go out to the end of this dirt road here. I'm going to walk out there. It was probably about 150 yards. I said, I'm going to go to the edge of the forest and I'm going to call those that cow and the calf out of the valley and see if they respond. So they're, they're out here at sunup. We'll get our shot. But uh, it was very dark and I couldn't see very much. So I grabbed my rifle and uh, I grabbed my moose call and I proceeded to exit the truck and I walked about 150 yards down this logging road to where it ended. And I uh, pointed the moose collar at the forest and I gave a tug on the rawhide string. The moose call was, all it was was a, a rawhide string that was going through a can. It was a big metal can with a rawhide string attached to it. And what you do is you just wet the rawhide string and you pull it. And it sounds kind of like a grunting bull but it's louder. It's a little bit louder than that. So I did that. I, I wet the rawhide string up and I walked to the edge of the forest and I gave it a tug and it sounded, you know, like a big bull grunt, you know, it was like pretty loud and it, it was like a very low pitched sound that vibrated through the still night air. And I waited a minute and uh, of course I did it again and started listening and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a, a, a crazy man start yelling out of the middle of the valley that I was, I was calling into. He, he started screaming like he was very angry. It couldn't be a man because it was too loud and it was too angry and I couldn't make sense of it. I couldn't understand why this this crazy man was in the forest in the middle of nowhere at that time of night. I just couldn't understand what was happening. So it didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I, I actually got a little bit spooked by that because I didn't expect to hear that. And it seemed like he, he was uh, having a, a fit of rage really down in that valley. And I got to thinking, I can't see anything. I better get back to the truck before that thing decides to come up at me and, and cut me off. So I, I actually uh, turned around with my rifle in my hand and I had a big rifle. It was a, it was a 30, 30 odd six, quite a big caliber. And you know, that gun could pretty much kill an elephant. And uh, I, I pretty much found myself running back to my truck with my rifle in hand. And I got to the truck and I jumped into the truck and I, Jess was sitting there and I said, uh, do you hear that? And she goes, she said, yeah, I hear that. I said, what is that? And she said, uh, I don't know. I said, why is that so angry? Why is that, whatever that is, so angry? She looked puzzled as I was. And you could still hear it screaming in the forest. And uh, it seemed to be having a, a fit of rage. And I didn't know why. I didn't know what the purpose was. Actually, I thought that somebody had escaped the uh, mental asylum in Timmins. And I asked her, I said, did you hear anything on the news about somebody escaping the mental asylum in Timmins? yesterday and she said no i didn't hear anything and i said well whatever that is down there or whoever that is is not all there 
they're not all there. Nobody gets that angry for no reason. I said, so what do you think that could be? She said, I don't know. I said, do you think it's some campers maybe that are playing a trick on us? Do you think they've put a, a speaker in a tree to try to scare us off away from their hunting area? And she said, well, possibly. And I said, well, it must be. I said, because I don't think a person could yell that loud and be that angry for no apparent reason. She said, it could be. I said, your door is locked, right? She said, yeah, my door is locked. I said, good, keep it locked and keep the window a crack open because I, I want to hear what's going on down there. So we kept listening and it seemed to be yelling and screaming and it didn't seem to want to stop. It was very boisterous. And I said, well, I said, what we can do is we can wait until sun up. I said, our hunt is probably not going to happen. Those moose are probably scared and run away by now. I said, I can't see them sticking around in the valley with that thing, whatever it is, with that noise going on there. But uh, I want to find out who's down there. So let's wait here and we'll, in the morning, you know, we'll, they'll have a campfire and we'll see the smoke and we'll go down and, and we'll find them and we'll find out exactly what's happening. And, you know, we'll look for their vehicle too in the area. So we waited there for a little while and all of a sudden uh, we saw a strange light coming out of the forest. And it wasn't a direct light. It was like a glow. And I said, there's the person right there. I said, they must be wearing a headlamp walking out of the forest. I said, but what in the heck would somebody be doing in the forest in the middle of the night? What would their purpose be? I mean, they can't do any shooting, but their vehicle must be here. And we're going to wait for this person to come out and we'll, we'll stop and we'll talk to them and find out what it is they're doing there. So the light kind of came slowly through. You could see it moving through the, the cut and it, it kind of came to a spot where, well, there was like a, a road that was behind us. Okay. And I said, well, I said, we're going to, that light, has kind of gone to that road. I'm like, we're going to see that person walk behind our truck and, and I'll get out and I'll talk to them and find out if they've decided to play a prank on us. Well, that person was never behind us. There was nobody that hit that road. In fact, as soon as it got light, I got out of the truck again and with my rifle and I, the road was right behind me. I went up it and I looked and there was nobody there at all. And I said, wow, I said, that is too strange. I said, what was that? I looked in the ground and there was no tracks. I went down the road till that road hit a dead end and there was no car there. I looked into the valley for a campfire or any sign of somebody camping down there and there was nobody there. And there was nobody actually in the whole area. Well, I'd say within six miles of me, there was nobody there at all. But there was a light that definitely appeared there. And it, we thought it was a person wearing a headlamp, but it, it, there was nobody there. It, it, there was nobody in the area. So we were, we were puzzled. And eventually, uh, you know, the screaming stopped during the night. It sounded like there was a fight between uh, a moose and whatever was screaming. It sounded like there was a little bit of a ruckus there, but it was not human and there was no humans in the area. So we were perplexed and we didn't necessarily think Bigfoot or Sasquatch at the time because that thought never crossed our mind. We weren't believers in Bigfoot. We didn't explore that realm of a possibility but the yelling was quite unlike anything i've heard before it was like a madman that was uh, having a fit in the middle of the forest at night we just chalked it up as 
you know, somebody was trying to play a prank on us, but we never did see anybody there. There was nobody there. And we were just left confused. So the next day, I we left the cut. We didn't really think that those moose were still in the area. Our hunt got cut short. We went back to the camp and we went to sleep and caught up on some sleep. And pretty much that was it for our moose hunt in that area because we figured those moose had been scared off and we had to start now looking at the new area. So I drove just back to town and I had to work that day. I had some small errands to do in the afternoon and I did my errands and and then I uh, called uh, my girlfriend up and she was an indigenous. She's a Native American Indian and uh, I thought, well, you know, she might have knowledge of what the strange lights could be and uh, what the yelling could have been. She might know something about that because Native American Indians are pretty in tune with the northern boreal forest and you know they spent centuries there and they seem to have some kind of knowledge that maybe i didn't have so i called her she was done work at about five six o'clock and i called her up and i said hey i said i had a really weird experience last night you know there's a crazy man in the bush yelling back on the cuts when i was hunting moose with jess and i said and we saw some mysterious lights and we thought they were, it was somebody, but it was nobody. You know, is there anything in your culture that maybe your mother or father knows about these mysterious lights that we had seen? And did you hear anything about on the news, uh, somebody escaping a mental asylum in town? Did you hear anything like that? And she said, no, I, nobody escaped the mental asylum. And she said, sometimes, and Native American Indians talk about witch lights that happen in, in the bush at, in, at night. And I said, witch lights? I said, well, what's that? And she pretty much gave me a little bit of an explanation there. And uh, I said, well, I said, I could take you there tonight if you want to see them. I said, and you, you, maybe you'll hear the crazy man yelling there. I said, do you want to go? It's really, really puzzling me. I said. I'd like to take you and show you. Maybe they'll come back. The lights might come back. And uh, maybe the crazy man will still be there in the area. Maybe we'll find out what it, exactly that was. And she said, uh, yeah, sure. She goes, I'll come with you and I'll check it out. I said, okay. I said, let's go. So she jumped in the truck. We grabbed the uh, rifle and uh, went to the camp. And uh, we spent the night at the camp. And the next morning at you know four in the morning we uh, got in the truck and we drove up to the cuts and uh, we parked in exactly the same spot you know this time i didn't get out though of the truck i, I just parked the truck in the exact same spot and i said wait you might see the lights i said just wait right here and she said okay so we were waiting in the truck and we're trucks turned off and we didn't hear any yelling but again, I didn't leave the truck and call, but we didn't hear any more yelling. It was pretty silent in the bush, but there from the edge of the uh, tree line came the lights again. And uh, I said, there's the lights that I'm telling you about. I said, do you see that? She said, yeah. I said, what is that? She said, I don't know. She goes, I've never seen anything like that before. I said, okay. I said, well, it's uh, coming towards us. so." Let's see, let's just wait here and see what happens. So the light came and slowly meandered through the cut and it came towards us and we were sitting there watching it and the lights came over and this time the lights got a little bit closer to the truck and there was a, a pile of logs sitting about 40 yards to the south of me and the light appeared to go on top of the pile of logs. And I could see a bunch of caribou running through the lights. But it, it was like the, the spirit of caribou, like a whole herd running through the lights. And I said to her, I said, do you see what I see? And she goes, a bunch of caribou running through the lights? 
I said, yeah. I said, that's what I see. And she goes, yeah, I see that. I said, what is that? She goes, I do not know. I said, have you ever heard or seen anything like that before in your life? She goes, no, I haven't. I said, well, you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. I said, and it is just too weird. You know, a few minutes later, the light dissipated, and maybe a half hour later, the sun came up, and we did a little bit of hunting, and we didn't ever track the moose we were after. We couldn't track those moose down. And so, you know, we, we left, and we were very puzzled by the whole incident. So we just really didn't know what to think of what happened there. And uh, I don't think I was very comfortable going back to that area at night uh, hunting anymore. It was late in the season, and there was no point in continuing to go back there, walking around by myself. I was a little bit spooked by the crazy man that I heard in the forest, and I, I, I couldn't make sense of it. I didn't think Sasquatch or Bigfoot. I didn't think any of those things. It was more of a mystery to me at the time than anything. So I avoided the area and continued my hunt somewhere else that year and uh, pretty much just left it at that. And it actually wasn't until six years later when I was on YouTube, I saw a video that was titled Sasquatch Audio. And I decided to click on it to hear what they sound like. And, and I'm telling you, it sounded exactly like what I had heard that night. And I put the pieces together and I said, you know what? I said, that's very likely. That is too coincidental that that sounded exactly like what I heard. And it was at that moment that I realized that, you know, that very well could have been a Sasquatch. So I thought to myself, I thought, well, if that happened to me in that area, it must have happened to other people. So I looked on, I typed in on the computer, uh, Ontario Sasquatch reports. And sure enough, there was about 100 Sasquatch reports, uh, most of them from up in that area to the uh, Bigfoot Reporting Center, I call it, the BFRO. So I said, wow, I said, I guess a lot of people have had encounters in the area, and that must have been what we heard that night. So I... I kind of pieced that together that way. It happened years after I had heard the screaming that I realized how close I was that night to an encounter. And ironically enough, a lot of the encounters that happened in the area were from moose hunters, people that were hunting moose that had gotten close to a herd of moose because moose will herd up together at that time of year. And it seems to be that the Sasquatch, what they'll do is they'll target them and they'll shadow the herd waiting for an opportunity. So a lot of the encounters uh, that I read about, it was from moose hunters that just had come across a Sasquatch as they were targeting moose. So I thought that was another coincidence. So I said, yeah, it seems to be that these things, they'll target moose and uh, they'll target animals like that at night. and a lot of the uh, encounters and the, the audio that people hear are, are at night. That was another coincidence. They like the nighttime. They're nocturnal. And uh, they like to pursue big animals. So there's a lot of coincidences there. So that's what made me uh, believe with some kind of certainty that uh, I had been relatively close to one and I had run into one and what probably happened was I was targeting the same prey that he was targeting, and that's probably why he got so mad, you know, and freaked out when uh, he realized that I was pursuing the game that he was pursuing. That's my explanation for it. But uh, I'll tell you, these things can become angry. And I'm sure if he wanted to, he could have caught up with me in the middle of the night because I, I, I couldn't see anything, even though I had a rifle on me. I'm 100% sure that he could have taken me out had I not acted quickly and ran back to the truck. Now, um, that was my first kind of close encounter with one. And uh, that's why all these coincidences had me believing that 
these things exist. And, uh, you know, I was pretty well seasoned, uh, hunter, you know, it was nothing for me to, uh, go in the bush at night, uh, with a rifle and, uh, hunt bear, go into a bear stand at night by myself, but for something to make me run away with a, a gun in my hand was obviously not a natural thing because generally I did not run from anything in the wilderness. But in this particular instance, I was running away with my gun in my hand. And uh, that was my first kind of encounter with them. And I didn't realize what it was till years later. My next encounter, it happened about a year later. And uh, this time I caught a glimpse of what I equate to, to being a Sasquatch. And it was, it was very peculiar. I was uh, sitting with my girlfriend in Timmins and she said to me, she said, my mother heard from the indigenous people on the reserve that they saw something. They saw something peculiar at the reserve. And I said, oh yeah. I said, well, what did they see? And she said, well, they saw a, a minotaur. And I said, oh, they saw a minotaur, did they? And she said, yeah. It had like a man's head with antlers and it had a, a, like a moose's body. And it, it walked up to a vehicle, close enough to a vehicle that they were in, and they all freaked out and they panicked and they drove off back to the village. And I said, is that right? And I, and I kind of laughed it off because I didn't believe it. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I said, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, I, I said, is that even possible? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So I kind of shrugged it off and I didn't think much about that. You know, I, I actually made light of it and made jokes about it. And it was kind of something I, I just really didn't believe at the time. Anyway, we decided to go hunting. We would sometimes we'd go to the reserve and we'd go hunting on the reserve. It, it had, uh, it's probably about maybe 10 kilometers wide and, oh, maybe 15 kilometers long. There's a little village there. I don't really want to name the reserve because I want to uh, respect the privacy of the indigenous people that live there and uh, they're pretty secretive about this type of thing so I, I can't really give up that location because i don't want to draw attention to them and i don't want to, people going there and asking questions it's just i don't think they want that by the way they treated the whole situation but uh i will tell you that we were camping there one weekend me and her parents and we were hunting moose and partridge or grouse we were relaxing and hunting and i had my hunting dog with me and we uh we shot a bunch of grouse that weekend and we were looking for moose tracks and it's a very sandy area there's a lot of sand there and uh there's a road that'll take you right back into the reserve it's it's about 20 25 kilometers long the road zigs and zags and you know, goes in different directions and there's side roads that you can go down and, and explore. And it's uh, quite, quite a vast area and it's uh, maybe about 140 kilometers from Timmins, this area. There's a village there. There's probably about a hundred indigenous people that live there in the village, but they have access to quite a bit of land outside of the reserve that's considered reserve land. And my girlfriend's mother being uh, indigenous, she had access to, to that reserve and we'd be invited to go hunting sometimes there. And, and we liked it because we had freedom to do what we wanted out there. So we decided to go hunting for a weekend. They invited us up and I think it was uh, around Thanksgiving weekend, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 2008. And uh, we were hunting away, having a good time and enjoying ourselves. And uh, on Sunday, my father-in-law, he came over to me. Uh, his name was Ron. And he came over to me and he said, Jay, he goes, we're heading out. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, we're heading out now. He said, but two miles back down the road over there, he goes, uh, 
when I was on my way back to the campsite, he goes, I noticed a moose, cow moose had crossed the road. He goes, I saw that her tracks, they're very fresh. He said, Is she, but she was at a full run. Uh, I guess he could tell because the the length of the stride. He said she was at a full run and she was, she ran into the valley over there. After lunch, he goes, you go back there. I bet you could catch up to her. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, you know what, Ron? I said, I, I will do that. I said, because we have, uh, you know, six, seven hours before dark. I said, I'll see if I can track her down and get a shot before I, we get out of here for this weekend. So we ate our lunch really quick, and uh, he took off. And I took off the other way, and I came to the tracks. And I looked, and I said, you know what? I said, this is very odd. I said, very odd for this moose to be running in the high country in the middle of the day like this i said you know broad daylight i said that's not normal i said something's got to be chasing this thing i said but regardless uh, we're gonna go after her and she had uh, run into a valley and the valley was very sparsely treed and it, there was like a white moss all over the ground and you could really see far into this valley you could see you could pretty much stand uh, on the top side of it and really see right down to the other side of it. And I said, we're going to be able to get a shot here because she's out in the open in the daytime and that's not typical. I said, uh, so we're going to track her. I said, so we parked the truck and we walked down into the valley and we kind of stayed on the upper side and uh, we were looking and looking and we kept walking and walking and walking and we walked uh maybe oh three quarters of a mile and we uh came to a crossroad there and uh we're sitting there and i i couldn't seem to catch up to this moose it seemed to be one step ahead of us at all times and i could see the tracks in the moss i could see where she had stepped down on the moss and where her tracks were and but I couldn't close the distance and I couldn't see her because she was staying kind of close to the tree line. She, she, she really didn't go out down in, in the open area. She stayed close to the tree line and she was zigzagging in and out and, you know, and, and I was pursuing her and, uh, and I could not catch up to her. So we, we came to a crossroad there, a little side road that we had run into and it was sand and I could see, you know, she had crossed it. And uh, I said, well, I said, uh, I don't, I think she's a little bit up there and I don't think we're going to be able to catch up to her. And, uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time, she goes, uh, I want to get out of here. I said, what do you mean? She said, I, I, I don't feel right. She goes, I'm, I'm very scared right now. I, I want to leave. I said, Why? She goes, I just want to leave. And she actually started to cry. She goes, I just want to leave. She goes, we got to get out of here now. I said, listen, I said, calm down. I said, I have the 30 odd six with me. I said, what are you afraid of? Nothing can get close to us. I said, anything comes close to us, I'm going to shoot it. I said, I got the, the gun here. I said, you don't have to be afraid. She goes, I just want to leave. She goes, let's get out of here. I said, listen, I said, we'll go back to the truck. Okay. I said, we'll go back to the truck. We'll get in the truck and we'll go down to where the road turns 90 degrees. I said, that moose will cross at that spot. I said, w when she crosses the road, we're going to get our shot. I said, because probably about uh, another mile and a half, two miles up from where we were, the main road that we were on, it turned 90 degrees. And she seemed to be going right to that area that I could see. So I said, we're going to go there and we're going to cut her off. I said, so let's get back to the truck and we'll drive down there. We'll hit the 90. We'll go down the 90 and we'll see in the ground if she's already crossed there. If she hasn't, we'll wait there on that road and she'll be coming into it. So we, we walked about three quarters of a mile back to the truck and... We jumped in the truck and we we followed the dirt road down and then it turned at 90 degrees and so we made the turn and i'm going nice and slow up the road and uh 
uh, and I'm looking for where she had, if she had crossed yet, and she hadn't crossed. So I, I followed the road about a kilometer down, and there was no sign that she had crossed that road. So I turned the truck around. I said, she's going to cross in front of us, right in front of us here. I said, let's just go slowly back, and she'll probably be coming out any time. So we we turned the truck around, and we started slowly, you know, going back maybe, you know, two kilometers an hour in the truck, and and we're just waiting for her to, to come out in front of us. And uh, I had the, the rifle in the truck. And I'm I'm going, and we're traveling back, and it's broad daylight out, and uh, we start going back, and all of a sudden, this thing comes out of the bush, and it's about seven feet tall. It's dark. It, it's it's kind of almost black, dark brown, like almost black. And I said, "There she is," and it's probably about 150 yards away from us. And I stopped the truck and I went to open the door to get the scope on it. Okay. Well, it turned around sideways and it took one step and it was in the bush. It walked across the road into the bush. And I said, you stay here. And I ran up to the spot where it went into the bush and I started going into the bush after it with the rifle. And I got about 30 feet into the bush and something didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. I stopped. I got a little bit of, a, a, a little bit afraid actually. I was a little bit afraid and uh I said, "You know what? I said I better go back out there and see look at the track that it left to make sure that was a moose. I said, because I didn't see a backside of that moose. When it turned sideways, I didn't see the backside of it. It turned sideways and there was nothing. There was no back end to it. So I said, I better go make sure that that I'm pursuing a moose here because something doesn't feel right. So I went back out to the road and I looked in the sand and there was no track. There was no track. It was all, uh, it, this thing crossed where it wasn't sand. It was like an old creek bed. And the whole road was mostly sand. But this one particular spot where this thing crossed, it was like rock, it, like loose rock, like an old creek bed. And uh, I said, isn't that weird? I said, if that was a moose, the points of the hooves would have left an indent there. I said, that is, this is, something's not right here. I said, I didn't see a backside to that thing. And it seemed a little bit dark to be a moose. I said, I'm going to call her up here, tell her to drive the truck up here and ask her what she saw. So I, I waved her over. I was a little bit embarrassed because I didn't keep pursuing that thing into the bush i kind of got a little bit nervous i was a little embarrassed by that and, uh, I, I waved her up with the truck and she came up with the truck she drove about 150 yards to where i was standing and i stopped her and i said come out of the truck she come out of the truck i said look at the ground here i said do you see anything and she said no i don't see anything i said what did you see she goes uh i don't know I said, when that thing turned, did you see a backside to it? Like a, the back end of a moose. Did you see that? She said, no, I didn't see a back end of it. I said, but you did see it turn, right? She goes, yeah, it turned. I said, you didn't see a back end. She said, no. I said, neither did I. I didn't see a back end either. I said, what color did you see? He goes, it was almost black, dark brown, almost black. I said, that's what I saw too. I said, that thing didn't move like a moose either, did it? She goes, no, it didn't. I said, it was much more fluid. It moved like weird. I said, well, do you think a bear could be walking on two legs? Do you think that's what we saw? She goes, I don't know. I said, well, would a bear have gotten down on all fours and ran away? 
when it stepped into the bush? He goes, I think it would have. I said, me too. I said, that doesn't make any sense. This thing was on two legs and it turned sideways and took one step and it cleared the road. So we were very confused by that. But I was, I said, I'm not going in after that thing, whatever that was. I said, I'm not going in after that. That doesn't make any sense. I said, you know, but again, we didn't think about Bigfoot. We didn't know anything about Sasquatch at the time. We just thought, that, you know, that that was fake. I didn't put the pieces together yet at that time. Uh, so oh, I said, well, I said, uh, we should probably just get out of here and go back to town because something doesn't add up here. So we packed up our stuff and we got out of there and we really didn't uh, talk about it anymore. We just said, well, uh, you know, uh, there's something not right there. And, but you see, the way that it seemed to be docking us at one point when we were on, on the ground and the way it came out and turned, and it was just very peculiar the whole, the whole afternoon. And uh, after we realized, you know, years later when I heard the Sasquatch audio, uh, some of the reports... And I found the BFRO, uh, some of the reports uh, were from that very same area where people had seen Sasquatches. Eh? So uh, on the way out of the reserve, I, I looked and I noticed that the indigenous people that live there, they had set up these totem poles on the outside of the village. And it kind of gave me a little bit of a creepy feeling like, you know, these people, they might know something. You know, and I thought maybe that's to keep that minotaur that they were talking about. Maybe that's to keep that thing out of the village, you know. But I, 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 in hindsight, I don't think that they saw a minotaur. I think they made that up. I think that they know the Sasquatch lives there. I think they live alongside it. And I don't think they like to tell people because they don't want any unwanted attention. They don't want people going there and, and trying to pursue this thing as because it, it could make it angry. Then they could be in danger when they go hunting or fishing and they go into the, the wilderness. If they make this thing mad and people start pursuing it, uh, it could change the relationship. So I think they're, they say things, they're very secretive about it, and uh, they don't like to talk about it. They warn people. Don't go back there at night, this type of thing, right? They try to keep people out of there. And uh, in fact, I was warned by my father-in-law uh, one night. He, I asked him, I said, uh, where does that dirt road there go to? And he said, well, that dirt road there goes to Ghost Mountain. And he looked at me, he says, you don't want to go back there at night. And I said, oh, no. I said, why? He just looked at me very peculiar. He said, just trust me. He goes, you don't want to go back there at night. So he, he, he didn't even really want to tell me anything about it for some reason. So I think I'm pretty sure that that day what we saw was uh, not a bear and it was not a moose for sure. And uh, I, I think that that's what made uh, my girlfriend feel very uneasy and, and made me feel very uneasy. And uh, there is an aura about these things. Uh, when you get close to them, you get very scared. Well, I'm not very usually scared when I'm carrying a 30 odd six in my hand, but uh, in this case, I was scared, and uh, we decided not to pursue the animal or what we said saw, because we couldn't make sense of it, and uh, we just decided to get out of there. And uh, you know, like I said, years later, I started connecting the dots, and I've since uh, then I've I've reached out to uh, some people that I know who live on that reserve, and I've asked them, I said, listen, I said, have you seen anything weird on that reserve? What have you seen back there? We're kind of curious because we had a weird encounter there, and they don't seem to want to talk about it. And these are people that my, my girlfriend, she's related to. They don't really want to talk about it. They don't want to draw attention to it. But I'm 100% sure that they know all about it, and they're well aware and we're pretty much well aware of it now. 
because of what we saw. And, you know, I'd like to go back up there this year, back to where I saw those lights to see if I could see them again, to see if I could catch a, a Sasquatch, uh, you know, screaming in the area, because I'm sure there's more than one. And, um, you know, I'm a big believer in it now. You know, after reading some of the reports and hearing the audio, I'm 100% sure that uh, that's what I was hearing and that's what I saw on these two separate occasions. So uh, be aware. I've I've noticed that a lot of reports uh, say that they're nocturnal. I know that, which makes them very tricky to find. They're very intelligent. They can outwit you. And they're expert hunters. They're very strong and they're temperamental. They target moose. And um, these are the things I've come to learn. And I strongly believe that Ontario's got a, a small population of them up north. So those are my Bigfoot encounters as an experienced woodsman. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track It's become and it been through it through the day on scrugs and skags Booking their bales to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch breaking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Summit on the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul in the tremor Look at Kentucky style There's all the air Sweet tea, come and say.